What's up, Radonites? Radonization here. Remember that really old video from 2013 called Living with Manic Depression? Well, I listened to it for the first time in, what, five years? <laughs> and, um, so I'm deciding to make a sort of response to it because I realized that there were a lot of things at the time that I did not understand. Um, originally I started writing it as a description in the video, but then it became way too long, so I opened a Word document and pasted what I had and just kept typing, and I realized that it was turning into a text-based long-ass rant. So, I want to read what I have, and if I have more to say, then I'll fucking say it. So if you haven't watched that video, you can go ahead and watch it. I'll link it in the description. You know, that thing below the video that no one pays attention to? Okay, so once you listen to that, you may continue from here on this video. Wow, 22-year-old Raytana had problems with optimism. Poor fool. So, back in 2013, I didn't know as much about myself or the things I was experiencing. The nightmares are caused by PTSD. Back then, we didn't even consider the possibility that I had PTSD until I saw a psychologist. Psychologist. Paxil messed me up, despite me saying I felt better. Paxil is an SSRI, just like Zoloft, which messed with me in 8th grade, and everyone else noticed the Paxil was making me act weird, but I didn't. That's when my shaking and twitching started. I actually took way too much the first time, and it made me sick. Ever since then, I shake and twitch, but it was worse when I was on that stuff. It ended up, over time, increasing my anxiety so much I was agoraphobic for two years straight. They took me off the Paxil and put me on an SSNRI. Effects her. Unlike the Paxil, this medication makes me feel things normally instead of increasing my adrenaline that makes me... Wow, I described myself as confident and not so shy. That fucking changed big time. It really was a mistake to take Paxil, but how were we supposed to know? Psychology isn't black and white, so most of the process of treating disorders is experimenting with things. The quote-unquote shyness through all of my life, I found out, is caused by social anxiety disorder, which I did not know was a thing until my psych psychologist, that should actually be psychiatrist. My psychologist at the time is different than my psychiatrist. My psychiatrist said I showed every sign of it, and then he showed me a book which confirmed, you know, the definition of it, and I was like, oh, fuck! If anything, I feel like the Paxil triggered hypermanic episodes. I also find it funny that I didn't realize there was a difference between getting too much sleep and sleeping longer due to lack of sleep. I've suffered from insomnia for more than 20 years, but if any of you also suffer from it, you'll know it can be a mix of not falling asleep at all for a few days, or four days at a time, and not falling asleep for many hours at night so that you sleep in until like three in the afternoon. Living with Mike has shown me it is not normal to wait three to four hours before sleep since he snores, and I could tell exactly how long it takes him, which is not long at all. And lately, the reason why I'm on my sleeping medication is because instead of three to four hours of me not, you know, before I get to sleep, it's, um, it's usually, I think it's up to like 16 hours now. I will stay up through the entire night and I may or may not sleep during the day. So it just depends on what my body decides it wants to do. But this video definitely shows that there were three things I did not understand at the time. The reasons for my nightmares, my supposed confidence, and my sleep habits. Though having manic depression does not make dealing with PTSD and social anxiety disorder sad any easier, but harder. Let's face it, adults in their young 20s still have leftover stupid. It seems there's a phase that they go through where they think who they are now is who they will be forever, and they know more about themselves than anyone else could because no one else is able to see them. Well, I've been wrong before, so it's no surprise I was wrong then, too. I'm still on that one antipsychotic, it's been working very well for me these past seven years, and still on the first antidepressant I was... Uh, prescribed. It's just been raised significantly. I think the antipsychotic's been raised significantly, too. 
Now I am on Effexor, uh, which I believe is also an antidepressant. Trazodone, which is an antidepressant that helps me sleep. It works better than Ambien because it doesn't make me, make me hallucinate, though I do miss the little man in the ceiling. And recently put on an anxiety medication that I can't remember the name of because I'm too lazy to get up. Oh, uh, to get up, open the cupboard, and check. I think it's propanolol. Oh yeah, my memory. Forget what I said about it getting better. It's gotten worse. It gets worse every day. Let's get back to what the effectser is doing. It is not causing any of the problems Paxil was. It doesn't boost my adrenaline. It doesn't cause my shaking to get worse. Actually, um, the propanolol has reduced my shaking. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't cause any side effects at all, except that all of my dreams are now so vivid, they literally look like reality. Which, now that I think about it, could be caused by the trazodone. I honestly don't remember, and since I take, you know, them in the same day, it's like, you know what, who fuck cares? I have realistic dreams now, which is cool when I have that short period of good dreams. What it does is it works to bring my emotions to a stabilized and normal level. With manic depression, as well as other illnesses, emotions are felt at extremes. If something triggers happiness, it's bubbly, giddy, loud, obnoxious, childish, silly, and annoying. If I'm angry, even at something trivial, it, I'm an explosive built with pure rage, which is when people tell me I'm, and I quote, fucking scary. Sadness is felt so intensely. Nothing, no one, no state of existence matters. It's the end of the world. My heart is doubled over in the kind of pain you feel when losing a loved one, even if, say, my high school boyfriend just broke up with me. Oh yeah, teens, your hormones are nuts. So if you think you may have a mental illness, go see a fucking doctor. If your parents say, you're just being a teenager, tell them that there's only one way to prove that, and if you're suffering from something you don't know, and you ignore it, it will damage you for life. I'm not joking. Any parent that says, any parent that says that is an idiot. Parents, no matter how old your kid is, if they express feelings of extreme depression or the desire to hurt and or kill themselves, that's a red flag, and that's when you need to see a fucking doctor. It actually doesn't say fucking, but that's how, that's how stupid some of you parents are, especially when there's so many fucking kids watching my channel. I, I want parents to be aware of my channel, really. It's better to be safe than sorry. You don't want your kids ending up like me and countless others like me. Just from experiencing myself, I don't want anyone to end up like me. At least I don't do drugs. Anyway, with the effects, sir, I can think clearly because I feel leveled. I honestly wish it would make it so I don't feel negative emotion at all, but that's not possible. I still, I still feel sadness and anger, but for reasonable things. Just like quote-unquote happiness or whatever it actually is because I stopped believing in hap happiness recently. There are situational things in life medication cannot fix because they have nothing to do with the illness. Unfortunately, I have been up at a point in my life where happiness is only reachable during small periods of time. Recent events have caused me to lose a lot of what was left of my bubbly and silly nature. I have a good feeling in my gut that moving out of California will enable me to build myself back up. I always talk about a wall that I've been building as well as armor. People cannot get to me when this wall is up. Well, recent events caused the foundation of the wall to weaken. Yay, metaphors! And an invader broke through, dealing heavy damage that I was not prepared for. I haven't even tried repairing anything right now, because everything is fucking shit, people are shit, I'm a worthless piece of shit, and I'm wasting my life with these stupid hobbies that no one is going to care about when I'm dead. Yeah, and... Emo kids have made all these feelings seem like a trend, so now full-grown adults aren't taken seriously when trying to express their feelings and thoughts. Sorry to tell you this, little brats, but adults can't be emo. There are no cliques in the real world. Stop living in this fantasy world where everything revolves around you. Children are the worst. Trying to get back on track, though life has broken my barriers at the time, I have not considered killing myself in over a year, and hadn't considered harming myself for a year up until one moment a few weeks ago. But you know what? I considered it. But I didn't do it. 
and this whole shit I said it in the video that I didn't want to die, I don't know if that was the Paxol or I was just ignorant. Right now, it's not that I want to die due, to, due to, to, to depression. It has nothing to do with my disorders. I want to die because I'm just sick and tired of this fucking bullshit. But still, it's not a feeling of just me wanting to die. I want the entire human race to just be wiped out. I'm afraid of extreme pain, so I hope it's quick, but regardless, the human race is a sickening species that has invaded this world long enough. And we all need to die. I just wish Mother Nature would come up with a plan for human mass extinction without hurting any other species. You know, the ones that are supposed to be here. I've gone off the road again. Let's get back on it. I describe mental illness as being as dangerous and as bad as cancer. Why? Well, what do they have in common? There's no cure. The treatments aren't fail-proof. I forgot to mention that there are so many different types that finding a cure would be impossible anyway. It makes every day for your remaining life a constant battle. You're constantly in both physical and emotional pain, and you can die from it. There's one difference that makes mental illness worse than cancer. Not only could you die from it, but you can also be a danger to many other people, possibly costing them their lives. And yet, people joke about it. Well, people joke about cancer, too, don't they? But people don't tell cancer patients to get over it. People don't accuse cancer patients of trying to get attention, sympathy, or pity. People don't assume cancer patients follow a stupid trend because they say what pain they're in or describe their emotional turmoil. People don't laugh at cancer patients in front of their face. Do they? Honestly, cancer's like the one. The biological weapon that is so unfair, it's one of the reasons I think God is a psychopath who loves to watch us suffer. Mental illness can come from different places for different reasons, such as maybe being hereditary, um, um, mutations uh, during development in the womb, or traumatic experiences, such as the case with PTSD. Um... Where was I? Mental illness can come from different places for different reasons, though still out of our control, but cancer can literally come from nowhere, like one of the characters on Hannibal, Bella. A single, tiny cell from her liver wandered into her lungs and was trying to grow a new liver in her lungs. She was sweet, had a loving husband, no kids, though Jack was considering it, before he knew Bella had cancer. Oh, spoiler alert. She did not deserve to have a cripple, crippling illness that resulted in her death. And you know what? Mental illness still is incredibly crippling. Um, it can be, depending on the severity and the type, just as crippling as a very painful cancer. Many of the few good people end up with cancer. I would only wish cancer upon a certain genre of human. However, me mental illness is just as unfair no matter what caused it. We don't choose to be this way. I didn't choose to battle my own thoughts and emotions for a majority of my life. I didn't choose to be suicidal or to have uncontrollable, uncontrollable urges toward other people. Violent uncontrollable urges, I meant to say. Thank God I have not been at a point where I have been convinced to act on them. I didn't choose this life, my past, my present, my future. I did not choose to have to battle myself every single day, and I sure as hell don't want to take a handful of pills three times a day. I chose this as much as I chose to be born with blonde hair. There is no cure for mental illness, but I sure hope they find one in my lifetime, which they won't because hope does not exist. If you're the type of fuck-up to harass people with mental disorders, please, instead of being said fuck-up, take our disorders away. By all means, take away all three of my known illnesses. I will bow to you and kiss your feet. I would gladly have both of my legs amputated in exchange for a healthy mind. Do you think I enjoy it? Do you think any of us enjoy it? Just because we decided to be open, we decide to be open about it doesn't mean we're fr fucking bragging. There's nothing to brag about. I wish I could take my disorders, pull them from my brain, and stick them into the brain of a snotty-nosed fuck up and see how long they last before they fucking kill themselves. Then I would be free, and we'd have one less fuck up to taint the already filthy gene pool, more like cesspool. I don't want this. 
I have never met anyone with mental problems who wanted them. And for you little kids that fake mental illness because you think it's cool, fuck off! There's nothing cool about it. It, it's so far from cool, it's more damaging than a burn caused by white fire. In case you people don't know physics, white fire is the hottest fire, blue being in second. Though white is just the color we see being on the visible spectrum, but the white fire is actually either indigo or violet. We cannot see this because the colors are not on the vis visible spectrum. I don't know when having a mental illness became a trend, but any of you who do this should be absolutely ashamed of yourselves. It's because of you that those of us suffering from real illnesses are accused of trying to get attention. It's even worse when you claim to be insane. Not all mental illness means you're insane. I have attacks of psychosis when they get really, really, really bad, when I haven't had my medication for a really long time. There are times when I am not anywhere in my right mind things that I don't remember that the person who who saw the attack has to tell me what happened afterward. But by definition, I am not insane. When I say I'm crazy, it's either referring to my eccentric behavior that has gone away, or joking by poking fun at my disabilities. I like to think that crazy and insane are not the same thing. To me, insane is mental, and crazy is behavioral. You can have crazy behavior if you're mentally ill, or if you're quote-unquote normal or whatever. But in my case, off treatment, we tend to be erratic, spontaneous, unpredictable, and socially inept, especially when having an attack. I have bipolar type 2, which means I have more depressive episodes than manic. Still, none of this makes me insane. FYI, insane people consider themselves sane, and everyone else has something wrong with them. You can't watch a show like Dexter and suddenly decide you want to be insane, or you want to be a serial killer. I've watched Hannibal twice, and I love the character Hannibal Lecter. I love how he operates, I love how easy it is for him, and how he indeed makes it look cool. But first off, Hannibal also is not insane, and that's not how real serial killers work. Are you a fan of my muffin series? For all the people who are like, I want to be like them! No. I may keep a sense of realism in some areas of the story, but these are fictional serial killers that would not be successful by any means in the real world. Fictional serial, serial killers are designed to appeal to the audience, to entertain them whether they are on their side or not. If you were to watch a movie about, say, Albert Fish, and the events weren't dramatized, his character not altered from his actual actual self, nothing about his history was changed whatsoever, the audience would be nothing but disturbed, except for the small few who can handle that. No music, no altered sound effects, it actually should have said added sound effects, no suspense, all real. The audience would leave before the movie ended. So, you know, that's why all of these fictional serial killers, Hannibal Lecter, uh, John Kramer, Pat Patrick Bateman, are so fucking cool. Because they were made that way. Their characters were tailored that way for our amusement. Our sickening, idiotic amusement. And if you say, oh, but Raytana, I am insane. No, fuck you. You are not insane because you have a warped impression I should have said perception of, of sanity caused by fictional media that puts ideas in the heads of idiots like you who can't differentiate between fantasy and reality. We believe certain things are facts because they were passed through the generations as fact, but in reality, they started because of idiots being idiots. Like the War of the Worlds quote-unquote scandal. It wasn't a hoax, and hardly anyone freaked out or thought it was real. Maybe two people called in to ask if it was real. There were no newspaper headlines, no chaos in the streets, and in fact, most people were tuning in to another station because something more popular was airing at the exact same time. For kids that claim to be insane, I want to lock you in the same room with someone who actually is, preferably someone imprisoned for a horrible crime they committed. Semi-related, only 12% of the Earth's population are sociopaths, and 4% are psychopaths. Yes, there is a difference, the most simple one being that psychopaths are born, sociopaths are made. I am a sociopath, and no, that doesn't make me super special because it's only part of the 12%, fuck you. 
fuck you. Like, seriously, fuck you. I don't know when it started, but I was not born one. I exhibit 80% of the signs, the other 20% being possible for me. I'm just able to control myself enough to choose to avoid them. Like being a liar. I choose not to lie. Go fuck yourself. It's conflicting being a sociopath and have manic depression. One is characterized by little empathy, and one is characterized by high empathy because of how emotional we are. Sociopaths can show empathy, unlike psychopaths, to a chosen few, like certain members of family or one or two friends. For me, it's two friends, rape victims, and people who have or are suffering through childhoods whether their case is you know, suffering through childhood whether their case is not as bad as mine or ten times worse sociopaths are also associated with animal abuse and i can't even watch a fake puppy's ne neck get broken without sobbing like on a movie like um what what's that one movie i don't remember the barbaduke or whatever it's called yeah the woman broke the puppy's neck, and as much as I know that that wasn't a real puppy, it still shattered my heart. <laughs> Psychopaths are different in more ways than what I just mentioned. And you want to know the funny thing? Neither of them are insane, and neither of them have a 100% chance of producing criminals. There are plenty of sociopaths and psychopaths that have never and will never commit a crime in their life. Respected people in history have been part of the sort. And also, you people who self-diagnose yourself can fuck off. Do you know how many times I've been accused of self-diagnosing? I'm sorry, would you like my doctor to call you and confirm it, or mail you the paperwork in my case? I am in my late 20s. I haven't played pretend since I was in my young teens. Even then, my morals were starting to develop. Do I like the fact that I am categorized as a sociopath? No. Do I like to find out that PTSD wasn't just for military veterans, and that I show every single sign except one by choice? No. Did I like that I found out my extreme shyness was deeper than that? No. Did I like my very first diagnosis that told me I was sick, but the doctors didn't explain exactly what was happening? Motherfucking no. Do I like my life? I like a couple of aspects of it. People claim I think I'm special, but I don't. I hate myself. I have known for a very long time that no one on earth is special. I am not perfect. I admit when I'm wrong, but it just so happens that I'm above average intelligence. Oh, that must mean I think I'm a genius, right? Fuck you! My self-esteem is so low I roll my eyes whenever my boyfriend calls me pretty. And any time I show a sliver of pride or try to boost my self-esteem by getting dolled up, I'm accused of fucking vanity. Oh yeah, and by definition, I'm not a narcissist. I only share one characteristic of a narcissist, and that's the feeling of entitlement. Uh, that's a result of my upbringing, and I have been decently aware of it, which is why I do my best to suppress it. It's not so easy when I'm unstable, but I've been stable ever since I started the Effexor. That means that every ounce of rage, self-hatred, and sadness is real, not caused by a chemical imbalance. Frankly, I'm surprised there are any optimists at all. But then again, I somehow always feel surprised at the percentage of idiots I come across, even though I should know better by now. That's where I stopped typing. But, I mean, I don't even know what else to fucking say. I, I'm sure I could go on and on until the fucking earth gets swallowed by the fucking sun. Uh, fun fact, sun is yellow. It's, uh, not very hot. It's hotter than orange, and it's hotter than red. It's red, orange, yellow, and then blue and white, which is indigo and or violet. So, yay, fire! <sighs> I'm just... I've been sick and tired of this bullshit, and I am sick and tired of this bullshit. I honestly... <laughs> I, I, if, if I liked guns, because in, in America it's so easy to get a gun, I could easily get a gun. I want to shoot everyone in the fucking head that pretends to be mentally ill, that pretends that they want to be a serial killer because it's so fucking cool, or people who accuse real 
<laughs> real victims of crippling illness, physical or mental, to be faking it when they're not. Oh, I'm so sorry there are honest people that exist in the world. They may be few and far between, little kitties, but they exist. I know that just upsets you so very much, but the truth fucking hurts, doesn't it? It hurts me every single fucking day. Every single fucking night I have to deal with a fucking nightmare that plays on all of my fears, all of my sensitivities, and I... Fucking, I'm fucking sick of it. I am fucking sick of it. I thought the anxiety medication was possibly shortening the, the nightmare season that I call it, but it's not. It, it, it may be a little bit, but it's hardly noticeable, especially when I have the bad nightmares. And the fact that they are so real. They are so real that, in, I, and I lucid dream. I, I can't remember the last time I actually thought I was in reality, but I always lose a dream now. Not by choice. It just happens. And I remember, I remember standing there and looking at the environment, knowing full well that it was a dream. And I was like, this is so bizarre. Everything looks real. I can look at people's faces like they're in front of me. They're not blurry. There's nothing blurry. I can, I can touch things and actually be touching it. And in some of my lucid dreams, I figure out how to walk properly. Uh, if you guys have um, heard my dream journals or read them or whatever, um, I often float in my dreams as a form of um, transportation. I can fly if I concentrate really hard. It was easier when I was younger, but it's hard for me to ascend to a high volume. But um, in one of my recent nightmares, I was able to ascend, um, to throw this girl into the middle, the, like, deepest part in the middle of the ocean, where there was also, for some reason, a fire burning, so she, like, burned and drowned at the same time. So, you know, I was, and I was high, like, above the clouds, so, you know, what killed her first, the impact on the water or the fire? <laughs> Should not be laughing about things like that. Should not be fucking laughing about things like that. That is not normal. <sighs> and you know what really gets me? Are the nightmares that play on my fears about my relationship. S there are different versions of Michael that are barely close to him. There's one version that's more similar to him than the others, and he rarely pops up. He's usually the one who proposes to me. And, uh, and he always proposes in really stupid, silly ways, which I really hope he does. I hope my engagement ring is from a 25 cent bubblegum ball machine. And, uh, you know, I've said it before, weddings are a scam, so, you know, we're not gonna spend too much money on, on shit like that. But, um, anyway. Uh, there's a ver version of him that's a weak fucking coward that can't stand up for himself or his woman. Um, but then again, his woman is also actually insane in these nightmares because reasons. I don't know, fucking with me? It also, it makes me what I'm afraid of. Of being. Of myself. And, um, a lot of times in my nightmares, I I'm unable to get my medication. I keep telling people I need to take my medication. I keep take I need to take it, and it's just not available. I forgot it or something, or I dropped it, <laughs> and it's 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 horrible. And then there are the nightmares where I'm left alone. Anyway, back to Mike. And there's um there's one that I refer to as Bad Michael, and he is a fucking asshole, and I fucking hate every single aspect of him. But thankfully, thankfully, when I wake up and I see the real Michael, when I see his face, the hatred of the dream asshole Michael does not bleed into the real world, and I can see him for who he really is and trust that I am indeed awake, if ever I question it. I don't feel like harming him, like I have countless times tried in my dreams, so, you know, I can, I can tell that 
he's real and it does it it does make me relieved when I wake up to see his face after one of those and I just have to hug him and he he always knows he always knows when I'm having my nightmares because because he um he says that I I I like thrash in my sleep sometimes I shake Sometimes I, I thrash violently, I wake him up, and he has to hold me, which I don't remember because I'm still partially asleep. And uh, and there are times when I've just woken up drenched in sweat. So, you know, that's fun. I chose that! I fucking chose that, you fuck-offs! And another one, another one that gets me is is whenever my dreams decide to bring my rats into this situation where they are in danger, where they are in a situation that they're not supposed supposed to be. Like me carrying them around in a half-broken cage to places like school or the mall or something. That's another thing, I keep going back to fucking school. Apparently I gave up at the one school on my, on my third run through. Uh, I, in case you don't follow my dream journals, uh, my dreams have continuing storylines. So I graduated, or did I give up on my fourth? No, I gave up on my fourth. I graduated from high school three times in my twenties. Uh, the, well, the first one was obviously my real life first graduation. Then the next two were by choice to increase my grade point average because you can do that apparently. Well, in my dream world, things shit happens but uh, on my fourth go and I don't even know why I was choosing to maybe I wanted a high school experience without the fucking hormones I don't know uh, but the fourth way through it was almost to the ending year tests and I just said I cannot do this I'm, I'm quitting and for some reason even though I graduated with high you know GPAs three times, my grandmother, who I am apparently living with in my dreams also, because I was living with her during high school, says, oh no, you shouldn't drop out, that's a big mistake, you shouldn't do that, and I'm like, I've already graduated three times, what more do I need to do? I can't handle the stress. And so she says, alright, well instead, instead of quitting, why don't you try transferring to this school? So I transferred to another school, and it's uh, our rival, the my previous school's rival, and it is fucking awesome. In my previous school, you know, high school rivalry, which I think is stupid, that you shouldn't be teaching that to, to fucking teenagers, you know, um, we, we were all like, oh, they suck, they're bad, their school is so bad, blah 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 I don't know, just get me some pants. And uh, I go over there and this, this fucking school, okay, this fucking school is fucking badass. And the fucking classes are fucking badass. Except for that one goddamn really old teacher that's a fucking feminist. And I just blew up at her and almost got a pink slip. But I think I caught out of it. Or something. It's like she, she, she said, she said something really, really bad toward toward boys and men in general, and it made me blow up. And, you know, even if I did get the pink slip, I would have just said to the principal, you know, she said this, she had it coming. Uh, the principal is cool. Um, the people are on and off, like anywhere, cool. Um, I started out wandering around alone, as usual. Uh, I... I've been to so many elementary schools in my life that I can't even count, and all I remember from each one is being the one kid who sat alone at the cafeteria and got made fun of until she made a couple of friends and then had to move and do it again and again and again and again. Over and over and over. So, you know, due to my social anxiety being much more heightened thanks to Paxil. Um, it, it, honest to God, had to be that because I was not this bad. I haven't been this bad since I was, you know, a kid. 
So, I mean, at least I know how to somewhat communicate. You know, I'm just waiting for, for that moment where somebody is so close to me that I say, Excuse me, can you please go away? Can you please back off away from me? There's a car alarm outside. That does great for my anxiety. Fucking shut up your car. Thank you. <sighs> One time there was someone's car alarm just kept going and going and going. And then it shut off for like ten seconds. And then it keep going and going and going. And somehow putting on my headphones and listening to loud music made it louder. Anyway, anyway. Uh, so the school. The school that I'm in. I have made very nice friends and honestly I recognize them by face I do not recognize them by name um those dreams are my honestly as realistic as my dreams may look they sound the names only some names are able to be differentiated uh among the I'm pretty sure I said that word wrong among the warbles that are everybody else um, I don't have the same bullies as I did at the previous high school. And this is all in a different universe than Randy and his gang. Which, funnily enough, uh, I haven't had a dream about bad Randy since the, since the one that I'd rather not talk about. Um, I mean, there there have been dreams where, yeah, he's an ex-delinquent, or, yeah, he, you know, he's kind of bad, but he's getting better, but his friends aren't. Um, I have many dreams where I'm cheating on Michael with him, and there was one where he found me, and I was like, I seriously don't know what's wrong with me. And, uh, in some... Randy is willing to fucking beat Michael up for me, and in some, Randy's like, you know, you always talk about him, you always talk about marrying him, you know, it's obvious that, that, you know, you, you love him more, so he gives me up. Which is nice, but in reality, I would never, ever, ever cheat on my significant other. That's why I broke up with Ruth, because I fell in love with Mike. Plus, she was also doing drugs, so <laughs> that helped. That gave me an excuse without telling her that there was someone else. But I hadn't gotten into anything with Michael. I didn't even know he liked me back. I just felt that I needed to break things off so that I made myself available. Anyway, so the school. The school that's not the same one as the one where I went with Randy. Um... It's... it's fun. There are... like... N like... fun things to do during breaks. Like, you know how you have, um, monkey bars and seesaws and slides during, uh, recess in elementary school? Well, it's sort of like that, but it appeals more to teenagers. And... I believe breaks are longer because I think there's a policy um, in the school that believes that if the students are happier and more relaxed, they do better, in which case it was fucking working. Maybe that was why my last high school hated them so much. Um, they don't focus too much on sports, too, so, you know, obviously they're going to lose most of the games, but who cares about fucking sports? <laughs> Football is killing people. Anyway, um, oh, I have an eyelash in my eye. That's pleasant. And it's, it's just visually pleasing. It's bright, there, it's colorful, it doesn't look like, cause, um, in my last high school, it resembles the same high school I actually went to, because in my dreams, I'm graduating from the same high school multiple times. And, you know, even after, my high school was renovated. Still, still fucking sucked. Okay, it was. It still fucking sucked. It was just concrete and and just. It just fucking sucked. I I hated high school. Though I have to admit, it's it was better than the high school I attended for my second summer of summer school. I went to summer school voluntarily for two summers, 
Anyway. And, um, I've met a couple of friends. Um, mostly girls. I think there's one male friend. But, obviously, they are much younger than me. Um, so I have to be careful with what I say around them, which is infuriating. But, you know, I don't blame them for it because they're sweet. They're so sweet. Um, I don't have a crush on anyone, obviously. <laughs> that would be so creepy. But there was this one guy who took a shine to me because he, I think he was a senior, and I had seen him around school, but we didn't share any classes. He was this, you know, typical punk guy, and a bunch of um, jocks were making fun of him, calling him emo and shit, and he he, he was... He was sitting against a wall, and he looked sad. He, he looked like he was genuinely feeling pain. And being the person that I am, who empathizes with people uh, who, you know, are in that kind of trouble, I went up to him, and, um... And I honestly have a pretty good reputation, because in my dreams I'm hot as hell. <laughs> if only... And, um, some of my bullies I've been able to win over. Like, um, there were three guys who were making fun of me. Um, until one of them made a, made a reference to Timmy and the Lords of the Underworld. And so I started going, Timmy! And they, they'd be like, and the Lords of the Underworld, Timmy! So, I, um, just because I got the reference, they were like, oh, this girl probably isn't so bad. But, um... This punk, you know, uh, stereotypical, uh, and he was punk, not emo. I don't even know what emo is anymore. Like, it, 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 it shits out so many, it takes so many styles, shits it out, eats it, pukes it up again, keeps eating it until it's just, I don't know, water? What happens if you digest your food so many times? Does it even come out anymore? <laughs> oh man, it feels so good to laugh. <laughs> um. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, you know, I go up to him and I say, you know, you look like uh, you're suffering. Um, I know it's not my place to ask, but I do, you know, I possibly understand what you're feeling, and if you need somebody to vent who won't judge you, I would be that person. And you know, being a rebellious, angry teenager, he, um, he showed disdain and dislike for me and replied to me rudely. I felt the rudeness, uh, I recognized it as, um, you know, the type of rudeness that a teenager who's a victim of bullying and suffers from mental disorders without treatment, also having to deal with hormones would. Because I was that teenager. And so, you know, I, um... I think I gave him my DeviantArt address. Um... I just have to repeat. Don't ask, ask about DeviantArt. I'm working on it. Um, I will say that there is a light of good news, but... Don't get too excited about it. Anyway, so I gave him, like, a card with my, um, DeviantArt on it, and, um, after I walked away a few steps, you know, he said, Hey, girl, and then he started walking with me, and this made me happy, despite how much of an asshole he was being, because he, he, he couldn't really help it, and part of him was forcing himself to be an asshole. It's like, at first he couldn't help being an asshole, but just to, um, maintain appearances and his masculinity, he wouldn't, um, show a kinder side. He would force himself to be angry, and that is, um, seen in many, in many males of different ages. Usually stupid males that, um, have been, um, you know, brainwashed in the society that you're not allowed to show more emotion than a grain of sand. I guess not men, not all of them are idiots. I guess idiots would be the 
men who feel they have to exude their masculinity so much that it borderlines questioning their sexuality and you wonder if they're actually gay. <laughs> but it's not, you know, it's not their fault, like, the, the ones who do it unconsciously, it's not their fault for being, you know, socially conditioned to believe uh, that they're not allowed to do that. Anyway. And he starts um, complaining about shit. Um, and I still didn't prefer the way he was talking to me, so I decided to um, stoop to his level. Because sometimes you could stoop to their level and make them angrier, or you could stoop their, to their level and earn their respect, especially if you're the opposite sex. And um, I started making fun of him for being a punk. I think it was the fact that I didn't call him emo that got him to lighten up. Um, I started, you know, naming off stupid punk bands that I hate. I'm like, oh, do you listen to Fall Out Boy? Do you listen to Panic at the Desco? Oh my god, look at all your patches and your ripped denim and your mohawk. Like, oh my god, are those gauges even real? And it made him laugh. <laughs> And it made it made him laugh because he he realized that I knew <laughs> what a stereotypical punk was and that he totally fell into that category. And because he was in his senior year, he he understood uh, that his fashion sense was you know just a phase that it would fade out, something like that. He was very intelligent anyway. Um. Then we were um, in the hall, and there was a lot of students around us, so uh, he managed to be dragged behind me, and we were practic practically yelling a conversation, um, him trying to, to, you know, tell me what was wrong, and I remember agreeing with him a lot, um, just because I did agree with him, not trying to make him feel better. Um, and then I think the, the dream changed to something else. Um, I haven't seen him since, though I see my friends all the time. One of them actually recently died. Um, oh, I do remember her name, though. It started with an E. Oh, shit. It wasn't Emma. It might have been a fake, like, a, a made-up name that my body was just like. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but the closest thing I can think of is M or Emily. Maybe it was Emily. I don't remember. Or maybe it was, I don't remember. I'm not going to take forever trying to remember a fucking name. But, um, we often go on these field trips that end up really, really bad. Um, I have been in multiple situations where we went to a quote-unquote museum that ended up being a slaughterhouse uh, for human beings. Um, we, we'd go to, you know, choir festivals that ended up being a... Um, a cruel scientific game that you could die from if you answer a certain number of questions wrong. And uh, it's terrifying. It's, it's really, really terrifying to be lured into this kind of trap and then be trapped within it. Um, it's even more terrifying when you realize before everyone else starts falling for it. There was one where we were at a carnival. Oh, we were at a carnival. <laughs> we were at a fucking carnival. <laughs> and and nobody realized that all the all of the people who were going on the rides went on the rides and never came back. And um me and two others investigated um by, uh, we didn't go on, on the, it was, a uh, we first noticed it on a trolley ride or something. Um, I think we might have actually gone on the trolley ride. 
I don't remember. We either went on the trolley ride or we followed it. And the um, track led into the pit of spikes. At, I think it was it was this, like, grinder or something. Or maybe that was a different ride. I don't know. There was, it, there was in, somewhere in the carnival, there was a ride that ended in a grinder that um, claimed that if you went into this, this, you know, tube, you'd get a prize. It was like a game. Yay! But at the end, it was metal spikes and razors and blades of all sorts that would render you into a liquefied version of yourself. And, um, one of my friends pointed it out. Um, she saw or, no, I think she heard it. She heard a buzzing sound, and we followed it, and we found the grinder, and, we, and our fucking classmates were just going in, and they they were sliding down the tube, and before they they couldn't even stop themselves. There was no way to stop themselves. And they realized at the very last second that they were about to be torn to shreds, that their entire body would be unrecognizable, that they would just mush together in, into nothing, into liquid, and, and it was, it was so scary, and we were trying to tell everybody, we were trying to tell them, you know, stop going in there, they, they, our friends are dying, they're dead, they're not going to come back, you don't want to go in there, and, um, but they just kept going, as if they were brainwashed or something. And my two friends, you know, they were like, we can't help them, you know, we gotta try and find a way out. So we were trying to find a way out, and when we realized there was no way out, there was no possible way we could get out without being killed, they, they accepted it. They willingly went into the tube and died. And... There, there was so much blood. It, it was so horrible, and I didn't, because that was fucking scary. And if I were to die, it would not be that way. So I kept trying to get out, and I think I finally, finally managed to escape due to a slip-up of the dude running the thing. Um, and I, uh... I went to my teacher said, everybody's dead. This is a trap. Everybody's dead. And they're, they're like, you know, what kind of prank are you trying to pull? I'm like, I'm not trying to pull a prank. Everybody's fucking dead. And um, I don't remember if we had been able to get the police on the scene. Um, but average police respond response is 10 to 20 minutes. So, um... The guy was going to kill us. We got in the bus and told the bus driver, you know, fucking step on it. So we were driving away, and the bus was dark because it was nighttime. The little lights above the windows weren't on. And um, I was sitting sort of in the middle of the bus, uh, my teacher in the front. We were all silent. Um... And, uh, I think my teacher called the police, but other than that, we were just sitting there. We didn't know what to say, uh, but, you know, because the guy knew we escaped, he probably anticipated a police call, and everything, like most creepypastas, everything was gone, and they didn't find a thing. In fact, the fact that those children were missing wasn't reported. They somehow wiped people's memories or something except for m me and my teacher and I mean the bus driver hardly knew what was going on but it's like they didn't exist anymore but anyway back to my friend who recently died we went out on a field trip and um it was like a space center we were like learning about space and shit and um they had an exhibit, um, 
that we could go through. And um, another two of my friends, no, three of my friends, M being one of them, um, she had dark hair and glasses. Uh, the other girls, there was one redhead. Um, her name started with a K. And there was a blonde girl. I don't remember uh, what her name was or started with. And, um... Oh, it's almost 8 o'clock. Shit. And the students kept going through these things. But, I mean, we were we were lagging behind... And we started noticing some clues that no one else seemed to notice. Um, things that we could form into sentences that told you what was going to happen in the next room. And that, but, but it said it in an exciting way. As if it's a good thing. Like, you're about to walk into a room with, uh, poisonous gas. You know, have fun. You know, it's, it's in happy colors and, and shit. Um, I assume it was subliminal messaging to, uh, people who may have glanced at it and their brain registered the meaning, but associated it with fun. We, however, I, we didn't notice it until I think M pointed it out. We didn't notice it until she pointed it out, and I and we, you know, caught on. And then we were like, well, we don't want to go in there. But, you know, we want to tell everybody else not to go in there. Um, and for some reason, Mike was with us, even though he doesn't go to school with me. Um, but we looked to the side, um, somewhere in the background, and we saw a different door. So we took the other door. And we ended up at the end of the room everyone else had gone into, safe and sound. Um, I don't remember, there was something special about the room. I think it was made of metal, and we had to uh, pull a couple of levers um, in a certain sequence to figure out how to open the other side. But there was no danger, there was no consequences except for time. Um, but the sequence was extremely easy, and we got out safe and sound. Uh, everyone else got out of the last room, and they were coughing and wheezing, and um, you know, said that was a miserable experience, but they didn't fully understand why it was um, so bad. The next room, we figured out the clue, said that we would be bathed in radiation. And, again, we wanted to stop everyone, but the tour guide um was very willing, very willing to bring everybody through it. Um, so we were afraid that if we brought attention to it, it would just, you know, cause our deaths even faster. So when we found the hidden exit, uh, this one was, this one was scary and dangerous. It was an elevator. It was like a cage. It was circular and it was uh, made of like metal cage. Um, it was transparent, but it was also in this, you know, cylindrical tube, so we could see the walls, but no one could see us from the outside of the door. Uh, the problem was, is the cylinder was bigger than the elevator, and it also started without us controlling it. So, M was the first one, uh, or no, M, M was the last one, to try and get on the elevator, we hear this ticking, and we're like, what is that ticking? You know, M, hurry up, hurry up. She misstepped, and we could have caught her. We could have caught her if the elevator hadn't shot downward. Um, and she was gone. We, we saw her body, and, uh, or, I think we saw, we didn't see her full body, we just saw her fall. And, you know, and the drop, for one, the drop was so fast and so far that we wouldn't be able to, she wouldn't, she wouldn't have survived at all. And for two, the fact that she uh, had been partially in the elevator when it dropped, she most definitely got torn in half. 
So we were crying, and we were going very, very fast. It was so fast that our bodies actually started to lift in the air um, toward the ceiling, where there was suddenly a fan made out of giant blades. It wasn't just a fan. It wasn't just a fan. It was made out of metal sharpened blades. But we were able to avoid them because we found that if we we um, were able to get this one spot where we couldn't get, you know, cut up or anything, we could slightly move the fans so that we could avoid the blades just enough until the elevator stopped. Um, so that was the danger. The elevator did slow down to allow us back onto the floor safely, and we got out. And M was not at the bottom. She was nowhere to be seen. There was no blood. There was nothing. And, um... We got out, and we saw the other students coming out, and they looked sick. And I saw Mike, and I, I hugged him, um, you know, because I hadn't really realized that he had been with us until the second room. I don't know why. And, um, he said, something's not right. And I said, um, you went into the, the, into radiation. And he's like, yeah, I, I kind of figured that, uh, but it was too late. And, um, I don't think we got to the third room because I went to my teacher and I said, M is dead. And, um, I told her, you know, what, how we had gotten past the rooms and how M had died. And the funny thing was, is I think M's death supposedly somehow happened in front of the teacher's face. And I was yelling at her because I was like, uh, you know, you saw, you saw her die. And she was like, I can see anything. I, I have poor eyesight. You know that. And I'm like, get some fucking glasses. Why don't you have some fucking glasses? You're a fucking teacher. You're supposed to be able to fucking see. And if your eyesight is that bad, why the fuck are you even walking around? And, um, when we, uh, I, I think we managed to, um, escape that place. I don't know how. I think, um, when the guy in charge of everything figured out that a couple of students had figured out and there had been a death that had happened, um, in front of somebody's eyes, that they had to let us go. And so they made up some bullshit reason why, uh, we had to exit. We went back to school, um, no one but my two other friends, uh, were convinced that M was dead, um, because they had, um, they had told the teacher that M had come to the tour guide and said that she felt sick and she needed to go home, so they sent her home, or her mother came and got her, and that she was going to be out for a few days. And, um, I looked right at the teacher as all of the students were sitting in their desks. Um, a lot of them were actually skeptical because here were three girls that were claiming that our, one of our best friends died. Um, I looked at the teacher when I was standing next to M's desk. I said, if M comes back, she's not going to be the real M. She's going to look like her, but she's not going to be the real one. Somehow I knew that they were able to make, like, copies of them or something. I mean, other than the field trips, though, the school is pretty nice, um, pretty enjoyable. Uh, I, uh, I don't know, it's just certain, certain things trigger absolute horrible things, and I never seem to know when everything is going wrong. Um, oftentimes, if we are driving, there's this, uh, there's this dirt road through an impossibly dark forest, 
and um, there's no room to turn around, but if you manage to turn around without falling off the fucking cliff, um, you go back, and you never end up where you started. And you turn around, and you are stuck. It's like the Lost Woods from um, Ocarina of Time. Or, frankly, any Legend of Zelda game. <laughs> and, and it was so dark, it was so dark, that our headlights uh, of the bus lit up about a foot in front of us. We couldn't see anything. Not only that, but we heard weird sounds, we saw strange shadows and what little light we had. And, uh, there, there was a, there was one time where we actually had, um, a monster thing end up in front of our bus, and we saw it the last minute, and, you know, uh, we all saw it. But we were going slow enough because, you know, we weren't going very, very fast on a road that you can barely see, and there's a nearby cliff. We we're going slow enough that we saw it before, you know, we had a chance to, uh, run it over in case it was like a person. So the bus driver tried to stop um, before getting to it, but it screamed at us and some of the students were saying, turn around, turn around, turn around, not realizing that this was not an opportunity to turn around. And I was like, run it over, run it over. So he, you know, slammed on his brake, or not uh, brakes, the accelerator, and just ran the fucking thing over. Um, we had students at the back of the bus trying to see if it was still alive, and I don't remember if it was or not. And um, I don't even know where we end up. But when I have good dreams, I really like my good dreams. <laughs> Who wouldn't like their good dreams? Um, there is uh, an entry on my WordPress that I might read out. It's called, uh, Something in My Dreams You Should Try. Um, when those things happen uh, in that entry, it's usually a pretty good dream. I've only had one where it was... Uh, somewhat nightmarish, uh, but I had pretty decent control over it. I don't like my nightmares, and I have a lot where, for some reason, I still live with Aaron, and no matter how many times I kill her, she just keeps getting back up. Even if, you know, I'm wanted for murder and I'm on the run, somehow she will still be there. I think there was something that I used to be able to do in my dreams that I just now, um, just recently remembered how to do. And it was like uh, this sort of bubble thing made out of pure energy, and I don't remember what they were called. And you're supposed to hold your hands in front of you, um, sort of curved like you're going to, you know, like you're holding a ball, and concentrate really hard on your energy or something, you know, things that you can't do in real life. And then... Um, yeah, and they have to be at a certain distance apart, and then you bring them together to just lightly touch and bring it back out to the way they were, and you have a, a glowing bubble of energy. And I don't remember at what time period I was able to do this before, but I recently remembered, like, I think I, a, I came to a class that was teaching it that I had learned it from, and I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. I don't even know if I can do that anymore. Um, so uh, some of the students were trying to reteach me. Um, and the first orb that I produced, um, I, it was amazing that I was able to produce an orb at all, being so out of practice, because um, most of the be beginners weren't able to produce anything. They were like, maybe I don't have the power. So, um, but I produced one. But it, uh, it faded really slowly, and I was like, no, no, come back! 
Um, the cool thing about these bubbles is that if you focus enough uh, on your energy, you can make them bigger. And once I finally got the hang of it, I started trying to make it bigger. What you do is the, the orb isn't touching your hands, but if you roll your hands around the area of the orb, uh, like it's encased in a solid sphere, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I don't remember the purpose of them. I really don't. But they're cool to look at. I had this really awesome fucking dream that was just really fucking awesome. You just gotta take my word for it. Um, it had to do... It was like a psychedelic experience. It was crazy. And it was wonderful. It's like, I wish you could lie down and have these experiences without hurting yourself. Like, just... Like I mentioned, my Ambien seeing the little man in the ceiling. <laughs> I'm not joking about that either. It, it's it's funny, you know, laugh at it, it's funny. But, um, honestly, I didn't remember the little man in the ceiling until Mike started, you know, saying, who are you talking to? And I'm like, there's a little guy in the ceiling. And, <laughs> and he was like, what the fuck? And he'd tell me in the morning, and I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't remember that. I wouldn't remember anything. And even though the feeling was fun, um, and it was loopy, you know, that's the kind of thing where, yeah, the experience is fun, but it's still a drug. So, you know, you were experiencing those things, there is something wrong. And so, you know, my body just couldn't handle Ambien. And that's when my doc was like, have you ever tried Trazodone? It's an antidepressant that people usually use for sleep. And I was like, no, I didn't try it. I'm willing to try anything to get me to sleep. So I tried it. No hallucinations, no dizziness beforehand unless I'm trying to walk around, which is a no-no. If you take medication for sleep, don't walk around. You have to lie down, stay still. Otherwise, either you'll get dizzy and sick, or you will make the medication not work. That's usually for over-the-counter sleep aids that aren't meant to, um, to be used as treatment for sleeping disorders. And it was like, it was a, it was a rhythm thing. There were, there was music and, I don't know, it was just crazy. I don't remember the dream I had last night. It's probably for the best. <laughs> this has probably gone on for long and I don't even remember what I was saying before I brought up the dream school. Yeah, I don't remember what I was saying before I started describing dreams. Um, for those of you who like these long-ass rants, um, I mean, thank you for listening. You are not obligated to listen to these. Um, honestly, I never expected more than, you know, one or two people to view a few minutes of it. Um, I do these because it is therapy for me, and since traditional therapy does not work, these are the things, and, and if you notice, my mood has kind of elevated just by talking about it, um, through the video, and I actually feel better, I'm not going to say happy, I feel better, um, uh, recently, King Spook who, um, is a creepy, a, a well-known, probably famous creepypasta reader, one of the tops that, you know, everybody knows of, um, took a leaf from my book and started his own long-ass rant. His aren't quite as long as mine, but, <laughs> you know, I, um, he's probably able to keep his mind better on track than I am. I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, like, um, like that one Tool song, uh, A Hooker with a Penis. I only know what he sells me. So, 
Uh, all, all you know about me is what I've sold. You dumb fuck, I've sold out long before you ever even heard my name. <laughs> so, yeah. I probably should get to what I call work, which is just another one of my mindless hobbies. Um, I'm also very sorry for volume differences in my audio. I know that um, this microphone actually does not pick up sounds from far away, and there's a lot of times where I'm um, unconsciously looking down at my legs or the desk, uh, and my mouth is not right in front of the microphone, so, you know, and I don't want to be like, well, turn your volume up, because there are also times where, you know, I'm loud, and I don't edit these, because fuck that. <laughs> it's the whole point, I'm on a, a narration hiatus right now, the fucking editing. Um, I wish I I had somebody I could trust to the fullest extent to edit my narrations, just just even the dialogue and, and shit. Um, but I am so picky, and I know, I just know, that even if the person could do a great job, for one, they'd have to do it for no money, because I don't have money to pay anybody. So that right there is unrealistic. But even if they did a great job, I, I didn't do it. So if it's you know, if the spacing isn't correct, if if certain things weren't taken out of that they should have been, if those stupid little clicks are even barely heard by me, I know that I would say, you know, it's good, but, you know, I kind of wanted it this way. And unfortunately, I believe that's part of the problem with my um, feeling of entitlement. Uh... It's also part of um, my perfectionism, where I feel like if I'm doing a project, it needs to go my way perfectly every time. Now, I know, I am aware that I'm not perfect, nobody's perfect, and I'm aware that nothing is ever going to be perfect, but that doesn't seem to matter to my mind. It's just like, no, if, you, if it's not perfect, it's, it, you're a failure, you're worthless, you're a piece of shit. I'm like, I already think that anyway. Why are you telling me things I already know? And it's just to keep beating me down more and more until I, you know, I'm just like, well, f fuck, then. I'm not even going to try. I give up. Um. But yeah. I don't know. There are so many things about myself I don't understand, and it bugs me. I thought I understood myself. <laughs> like I said, that phase in early 20s where you think you are and will be. <sighs> I'm 27 and I don't know what I'm going to be. In a year, five years, ten years. Hopefully in a few months we'll be out of here at least. It'll be so much better. I want to go to Canada. <laughs> But it's not so easy to move to a different country. Canada just seems amazing in every way, even with, you know, whatever problems that every country has. It just it just seems so much better than America, and I'm just like, I would willingly go to Canada, you know, if we could. <laughs> Fucking to not pay... Three hundred dollars, uh, you know, then that's if the that's only if the insurance decides not to cover it for some reason because bureaucracy is shit. Um, you know, I'd be able to get my medication and treatment over there just fine because free health care, yo. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, America is still the only country without free health care. Yay, America, home of the free, or what, what, land of the free and home of the brave, the American dream, oh my god, America, we're so great, 26th freest country on the list of free countries, if I remember correctly, I don't remember if it was the UK or Canada, one of those two is number six, Hong Kong is number one. 
So fuck America. <laughs> Not fuck yeah, fuck it. I hate America. That doesn't make me a terrorist, okay? I hate, I hate our country, I hate, I hate our government, I hate the way things are run. And then there are people who are like, Oh, but it could be worse. You could be here or there. And I'm like, yeah, it could be worse. But it's not. You know, that's I'm not experiencing that. I'm experiencing this. This is the thing that I don't like. And this is the thing that I don't want to be experiencing. So these are the things that I do want. And, you know, my wants and Mike's wants, and Senpai's wants, and anybody else's wants are not the same as other people's wants, okay? It's like the whole thing with wasting food and starving children in Ethiopia. Well, you know, then why aren't we sending food to them all the time? If we have so much food that we have so many leftovers, why is it, you know, do we actually care? Or are we just trying to make ourselves seem privileged? Uh, are we just trying to make ourselves uh, think that we have luxury? I, I feel like, and I don't know if this happens in other countries, because uh, I've never been to another country except for Mexico, but I was in Tijuana, and Tijuana sucks. So, um, if, if you come from another country, uh, please tell me if, um, if people do this, where if, if, uh, if you complain about something and somebody says it, uh, tells you that you shouldn't be complaining because there are worse lives out there, you know, it's like, okay, well, are you doing anything about it? You know, are you helping the people who who don't have what we have? It it's almost like a a shaming aspect. You know, how dare you complain about things that other people don't have? How dare you, you know, waste food that, you know, other people can't eat or something? And it's just like, well, fix it then. If America's so great and we shouldn't be complaining about these things, go fix it. But no, we actually don't care. We pretend we care. That's why so many uh, so many charities are bullshit. That's why I, I don't donate to charity, because I don't trust them. They're, most of them are bullshit. Um, I don't know. I, I just feel like it, it's a um, half a an attempt to boost our already overinflated ego or an attempt to strike you down when you know when you're having a trivial problem and voicing it like humans do but no shut your mouth and put your head down and only do what everybody else does so that means if everybody else is shaming that one person who's complaining about something that's a luxury in a third world, world country, you should do it too. Bah! <laughs> Why can't I do my sheep sound anymore? I can do my goat. Bah! Oh man, that was like a sick goat. Like a really tired, weak goat. Bah! My animal sounds. It's because my throat has been itchy for a worrying amount of time, actually. I can still do my chicken, though. That's my chicken. Anyway, if you've listened this far, cool. If you haven't, then who am I even talking to? And, uh, make sure to subscribe, spread the word of awesome, become a Raytonite. Uh, I feel like there was something that I wanted to ask of you guys before I signed off. Um, but I don't remember, so, um, see you later, alligators and crocodiles. Goodbye. <laughs>